founded Pivot9 uh, quite some years ago now, and we've been doing messaging positioning for well for several years um, with lots of lots of companies, uh, big and small. So we we do a lot of work with startups, but we've also done some work with some quite large enterprises, uh, some names that you will have heard of, and uh, it's it's worked reasonably well. So people seem to enjoy what we do. Um, so. Yeah, we've been invited to to talk with you all and just give you some advice based on our experiences with uh, with with clients and and our process. Uh, people seem to find it valuable in uh, in refining their message, particularly at a at a kind of weird and strange time that we're all going through. What our process is about is that it's it's really it's iterative. So we've had people who've come to us who've either decided that their positioning isn't quite right or they've, they've been struggling with it in market a little bit. We've had a couple of people who, who come to us, run through the, the exercise, and then they, they change the way they think about their positioning. And that just, that refresh helps them to have kind of new energy into what they're doing. And then when they go into customer meetings after that, they find that it, um, the reaction from the customers is, is much quicker. Um, but it's, it's a story we've heard a few times where they'll go to a client and they'll say, the, the customers are kind of not getting it and it's really frustrating and taking 20 minutes to explain when they retune their positioning customers just get it much quicker and the conversation moves on from okay we're talking about trying to get you to understand what we do and getting into okay how is this going to help us get into the details um, and it's a much more interesting conversation uh, so at, at the moment largely what we we try to focus on with startups in particular is about not wasting your runway um, you've only got so much and typical of all startups everywhere there is too much to do and not enough people to do it and not enough resources so it requires a bit of focus and a lot of what you're doing is about making bets so you're already in a high risk situation so what we're trying to do is reduce the risk in areas where you don't need to be taking additional risk um, that means that you can then focus on making bets in areas where you'll get a bigger payoff um, so Positioning and messaging means that you can actually be, you can have higher confidence that the marketing activities and the sales activities that you're going through will be more effective. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And right at the moment, all your customers are busier than ever. So they're already distracted as, as all of us are. So it's, it's a lot harder to actually get cut through. It's a lot harder to get them to understand that they should pay attention to what you're doing. So we, we consider that to mean that, well, your positioning and your targeting needs to be better than ever because it's so much more difficult to get attention and it was already hard to do. But there is a sort of a silver lining, if, there, if, there can, if we can call it one, uh, which is that all of your competitors are really distracted at the moment as well. So if you do well, uh, then others are going to be distracted and aren't really paying that much attention. So you can potentially do better than you might have in other situations where they weren't as distracted. So your position is all about what other people should think about. So right at the moment, if, if you think about how, how are we gonna do this? How should we refresh things? A good way to start is to just go, okay, what do my customers think about me now? So you have a position already. Some of you have, have tried to do one deliberately. And generally what that means is, okay, I'm trying to get you to think about something. Do you know what people think about you already? Do you know what they think your position is? Can you prove it? That's, that's the place to start because that's where you're trying to find, is there a gap between what I think, what, what I want people to think my position is and what my position with them actually is. So if your customers think your position is X and you think it's Y, you're wrong. Your customer's the one that, that matters. So positioning is all about what you're doing to the mind of your prospect. It, it doesn't really have a lot to do with your product. Um, you can change your product to influence the positioning. You can change the pricing. You can change where you're making it available, the classic four P's of marketing. But it's all about your customer. So you, if, you, if there is a gap between where you are and where you want to be, then identifying those two points and then plotting a path between them, that's what, that's what the whole exercise is about. You don't want to get into the situation where you say, well, that's where I want to go. And then you look around you and just go, well, I, don't, I wouldn't want to get there from here. Uh, like the old joke about directions. Uh, so the goal, when you're doing a refresh, come back and start thinking about where am I trying to go? 
understanding where that, what that goal is, which is a distinctive position and message, that's, that's the core of everything. And that's often where we find people uh, running into a bit of trouble, where that goal is not clear, um, particularly among, among the founding team or some of the other employees. Um, we've found, so one client in particular, uh, they, they had a pretty good idea of what they thought their position was, but the rest of the team didn't. So they, the rest of the team, so even the VP of marketing was coming to the founders and asking them questions fairly often. So they ended up becoming a choke point for all of the information throughout, throughout the organization. And that actually slowed everything down. Or people were afraid to make guesses about what, you know, I'm about to go and do some marketing activities. I'm not really sure whether this is actually gonna be on brand or on message because I'm not really clear on, on what the message was. And they tend not to know that consciously it tends to be emergent from the from the behavior. So if you see those kinds of behaviors going on, it it indicates that maybe people don't really know what the message and what the position should be. So they, they're constantly asking you for questions to validate, am I on the right track? Do we understand what's going on? So having good positioning will actually help you with um, organizing things, particularly when you're remote and you don't you can't just wander down the road and have a quick tap on the shoulder and say, hey, does this look right to you? Um, so having a good position will, will help you manage things in a distributed fashion. And the position is all about being different, uh, is all about, yeah, being different, not better. So we, ice cream is a good example we like to use. Some people like vanilla ice cream, some people like chocolate, and that's okay. You don't have to convince people who currently like chocolate to like vanilla instead. Your goal is to go and find all the people who like chocolate. Um, and as Ted pointed out to me on this slide, and I hadn't noticed it until he did, someone likes avocado ice cream. Um, if you are trying to sell avocado ice cream, then you need to go and find your avocado people. Trying to convince vanilla people to like, um, to like avocado, that could be really, really tricky because you're trying to sell a product. You're not trying to convince someone uh, to convert someone to your religion. So don't do that. You're just selling a product. Another thing that we see, another mistake that we, we often see people make is that uh, they try to be somebody else. They're trying to outdo a competitor. They're trying to be better than them. And you tend to fall into the trap where you're copying them or you're trying to do the same as what they do. And it's, it's really easy to understand why, because you're trying to create the same benefits to your customer that your competitor has. Creating the benefit is what you're trying to do. You don't have to do it in the same way. Do it in a way that's unique to you. Um, be the best you you can be because no one else can be more you than you. The reason we have a look at the theory and the, the reason we explain the theory to clients is because it's all about making explainable decisions. So we, we want to understand why did we choose to take this position and not a different one? Why are we choosing this go-to-market plan and not something else? So that way you can explain it to other people and you can also explain it to your founders and uh, sorry, to your investors uh, and you can explain to them what the plan is for the next round. You can also explain what it would take to change your mind. So then you can figure out, okay, this is where we will know if we're wrong and need to change things. And that's really important, particularly in the early stages where there's a lot of stuff that you're not gonna be sure about and you need to change direction. You need to be actively looking for evidence that you're wrong about things so that you can change them. Um, that's the whole plan. So this is the framework that we use. It's, it's basically just textbook marketing. There's not really any magic to it. Um, there, there is a bit of a strategy and execution piece, but we, we always caution clients that execution on, a, if you can't execute the strategy, it's a bad strategy. So this idea that, oh, we had a great strategy, we just didn't execute it very well. Strategy needs to take into account the ability to execute. So if, you, if your strategy requires you to be a thousand person company with $20 billion in budget, and you don't have that, that's the wrong strategy. So always take into account what you're actually resourced to do. Um, the, the flow in this, is the Febreze case study that I linked you to, the, the video, um, I, again, if you haven't watched them, I highly recommend it, it's only about 10 minutes. Um, the, th that's exactly what they did. They, run, they ran through this process where they went, okay, our positioning and our messaging isn't working at the moment. We're not seen as different from our competitors what's going on. So they went and did research and then they had a look at that and they analyzed the research and they updated their targeting and positioning and messaging so that they could then try something new. 
and then they checked it afterwards through, you know, they did the communications and then they did tracking to make sure, did it work? The thing about this framework, um, and it's something that we see often with clients when we first start working with them, we say, oh, we're gonna go through this exercise. We don't have time for research and segmentation. We just wanna get straight into doing comms. So I understand the impulse. The problem with that is that it's, this process is a lot like being on a train. Um, trains go forwards and backwards. You can't jump off the tracks and, and go sideways. So you can't shortcut from segmentation straight across to comms. Um, people have tried and it just doesn't work because you don't know what your position is. You don't know what the message is. You, like if you haven't done the targeting, you don't know who your audience is and you can't brief an agency on who they're trying to communicate to and you can't write good copy because you're not thinking about your audience or you're writing for the wrong audience. So you can change it, but you need to go forwards and backwards like a train. So if you decide that, oh, my communications isn't really working, back up only as far as you need to. So back up to the messaging and go, is our messaging right? How do we know? Okay, we're not sure about that. Back up one more. Let's look at the positioning. Is the positioning actually accurate? Are we, are we, on, are we positioned well for, for the target that we've selected? Keep going back as far as you need to and then go forwards again. And if you look at your research and you check out, okay, we only need to change our positioning, fast forward all the way through segmentation and targeting. You don't need to redo those parts if they're still relevant. A week in the lab can save you an hour in the library. This is one of my favorite sayings. Um, a lot of people are really reticent to read a book. It's much more fun to just start writing code. Um, go and look it up and use a standard library rather than coding your own, like don't write your own crypto. Um, unless you're a genius at, and have a really good background in fundamental mathematics, rolling your own crypto engine just because you're trying to create web pages is insane. So don't do that. Um, the quick way to think about positioning um, is basically what makes you special. Um, think about your company. What are you doing? What is it that makes you unique and special? Really understand what you're about, what resources do we have, who do we have with us. Um, this is one of the benefits that having external agencies come in and work with you uh, is about, is that they can often point to things that make you great that you kind of hadn't noticed. Um, advisors can tell you that your baby is ugly, but they can also tell you about the hidden beauty that you've missed. Like you could be focusing in one particular area that you think is what makes your company amazing, and actually, you've got this other thing that you've got going on that you haven't really noticed and you're not appreciating because you're too close to it. And we've seen that with a couple of, a couple of customers where they thought, they thought that their product was about one particular area and we came in and said, well, that's nice. And you're talking to developers generally and, and okay, open source development is where you, that's kind of where you've come from and that's what you've got going on over here. This part of the product that you've built here, you've kind of been ignoring is amazing for enterprises. You should possibly have a look at that because we think that there's a lot of value in that. You're not really, you're kind of struggling with the part that you've built that's free and open source and there's a long runway ahead of you to, to get that to work. Like that's two, three years worth of work to get that to happen. You could probably sell this other thing you've built in the next two to three months. Have you tried doing that yet? Um, but you also have to understand what you're not. And I'm sure lots of you are struggling with this every day. Um, the process of decision making about choices. You have to filter. You have to say no. This is the hardest thing to do because you don't really have a lot of information. Um, trying to find more information to make better choices is one of the activities that you're all going through. But you're going to have to make some bets based on the best information you have available and just run with it. Um, some of those choices might be wrong, but most of them, if you've done your homework, you should have a pretty good idea about what the right choices are. And for the other ones, you just have to say no. And particularly right now where runway is limited, um, funding opportunities may be slightly more reduced, people are a little bit scared, making choices about what you're doing and saying no to things so that you can focus on what you really need to do, that's gonna be critical. But you also have to look at what is special to who and really focus on your customers, understanding your customers, spending time with customers and getting out there and getting feedback from customers as early as possible and as often as possible is, is really, really important. Particularly with early stage companies, um, 
it's actually more about a sales process and you need to be finding potential customers and talking to them and getting your salespeople, if, you, if you've hired sales, if you haven't the founding team, you are the sales team, go and talk to your customers and get them to give you feedback on product. Um, get them to give you feedback on messaging. You, you can get rapid feedback from messaging by using your sales team and using those sales conversations. That's your message testing. It's much, much quicker than putting research in the field, um, doing, actually designing and running a proper formal validated research survey is time consuming, it's a little bit expensive, but the results take ages to get back. Um, you can get really rapid feedback just by going out and talking to customers and testing new messaging. Um, test it with some customers and with other customers, use different phrasing so that you, you are kind of doing a bit of an A-B test, but you can get some early indication of, okay, we, we were thinking of this new messaging, how's it going? Do we think it works? Um, you also have to make sure, are you actually being different? Are you just copying your competitors because you're scared and because things are, are, are a bit weird right now? We, we've been through a few recessions ourselves and we've seen that kind of behavior happen a lot in past recessions where people basically just retreat back to what they feel comfortable with and everyone starts to copy each other. Um, everyone just says, oh, we'll just follow the herd because it's nice and safe. Um, that, that can be true. Um, in a lot of things, it is very safe, but it also doesn't mean, it, it means that you don't stand out. And that means that if your competitors have other advantages, like the fact that they're bigger and have access to bigger marketing budgets, if you, if you just copy them, those other advantages they have, they're going to beat you. Um, mostly just because more people will hear of them. Um, with the targeting continuum, this is how we think about it. Um, there, there's two ends, um, and, th and this isn't particularly controversial. Um, there's either mass market and undifferentiated, just put it out on TV without, you know, it's, it's just an ad, it shows up late at night and talk about the price, here's the product, please buy it. Um, and then there's micro-targeting, which is the segment of one, the, the holy grail that Facebook l would like you to believe in, where you can micro-target every single possible customer who's ready to buy you right now and then they'll just click. The risk with micro-targeting is that you're actually missing the rest of the market. You're missing the people who aren't ready to buy and priming them ready to know about you when the time is right. Um, mass marketing is really expensive and none of you really have the resources to do that. Um, and honestly, most of the companies, the early stage startups who actually do take that approach, when, by the time you hear about them doing the mass marketing side of things, they've already been doing the micro-targeting and the, and the standard targeting side of things. That got them to the stage where they could then start broadening the message and start attacking a bigger market. Um, so we generally advise people to aim about here in between sophisticated mass marketing, which is essentially targeting, um, targeting within a particular market category and doing a, a broad brush of integrated marketing communications. Micro-targeting is risky because you have to be really, really sure that you're targeting the correct people. Um, if you miss it, then you've just spent a whole bunch of time targeting the wrong folks and they're not going to buy and you just wasted a bunch of money. Um, the other risk is that you're not talking to all the people who haven't heard about you yet or who aren't already interested. And for early stage companies, that's pretty much everybody. So your, your problem is that no one's heard of you. Uh, so go to market early stage selling. I'm sure you're all right up to the up to your eyebrows in in early stage selling at the moment. So here's some here's some tips that we've we've seen that have worked well for clients in the past. Um, you have a sales tube. You don't have a sales funnel. Um, what you want to do is point your tube at a direct directly at a targeted market and get everyone who comes into that tube to flow all the way through. Um, Yes, you can build a funnel, but particularly right at the moment when we're all remote, um, a lot of the early stage lead gen act activities like events don't exist. Um, or if they do exist, everyone there is trying to figure them out as well. So the leads that you have are actually a bigger risk. Um, a tube generally works better at, a, uh, at an early stage firm because you don't have the resources to create the really wide funnel that gives you that, that high drop off rate. Uh, but it actually targets a big, big market because of what we just spoke about. You need to be targeted. But now the idea is that you want to get everyone who comes into your sales tube, um, you want all of them to turn into sales. You don't want them to fall out of the tube. So things like automated marketing, um, those nurturing campaigns, where if someone expresses interest, you want them to stay engaged with you 
but in a really a reasonably efficient way so that they don't actually fall out of the tube if that once they come in they stay there even if it's in a holding pattern but they do eventually come through and turn into uh, turn into customers there's only two ways that you can increase uh, the number of people who convert one is to create a bigger tube um, when you start to increase the mouth of the tube it does start to turn into a funnel because it becomes less efficient if you go really really broadly targeted um, you will be targeting lots of people who don't care and are going to just go yep not interested filtering them out takes effort it's something that people often overlook they think oh people will just go away if they're not interested what often happens though is that they'll come through and depending on how good your lead scoring mechanisms are you'll actually score a bunch of leads and they'll end up with sales or they'll end up with marketing and you're spending a lot of time and energy trying to move these people through the funnel and you didn't need to spend all of that energy if it was better targeted because everyone who comes in you have a really good pathway of, of either content or you've got really good sales collateral and it generally works. The only, re the only problem that you'll have is that they're not ready for you. They want to buy from you or they're interested in you, but they aren't in the right position. And you can qualify that really early and just flag them and then leave them in place. That's generally the way that you want to do it. The other way to accelerate people through is just to have a really efficient um, sales tube um, or sales process. And this is all about understanding really good lead scoring, understanding what the customer journey is going to be as they go from, okay, I've never heard of you, okay, now I'm aware of you, I'm going through exploration, consideration, whatever the, the process is that you use, whatever framework you wrap around that. If you can get people running through that process really, really quickly, all the way to buy, then it turns into sales much easier. And that's, that's what you're going to be needing to grow. And particularly at early stage, you want to be getting those early stage customers to convert across to either be a paying customer or to pay in something that isn't money, like case studies getting people on the record with a full case study really early is so important. Um, the, the social proof of the fact that other people have picked you and are using you and will go on record and you can use it in PR campaigns and you can get articles written about you, the fact that you've done this. Um, it, it works really, really well and is kind of underestimated, I think. I, the value of PR is uh, particularly for early stage companies is is amazing and often outweighs other marketing activities like standard advertising so summary of how good positioning can help you um, you'll get better leads uh, people who are already likely to like you like go and find the people who will be your best friends that's that's really what you're trying to do and that means that you're freeing up a whole bunch of resources spent trying to convert people who just they just don't care they're not into it it's like and that's fine leave them alone um, there are, if you are right about your company, there are enough people out there who want to be your friend. You just have to help them find you. Um, faster flow, it just, if it's better targeted, then people will be convinced faster and earlier. And it could just be you go in, you have one meeting and they say, yes, this is amazing. Let me buy 700. Shut up and take my money. That's ideal. Doesn't happen as much as we'd like. Uh, sometimes it does. Uh, but if you can get to that more often, it's just a much more fun way to run a company. Um, you also have fewer people fall out of the tube. So if it's more efficient, you, it, you understand what the comms needs to be. When you have a really good position, then all of the things in whatever your sales process looks like, all of those, uh, all the sales collateral, all the website uh, things that you're doing, all of the, con if you're doing um, a content-based strategy, all your content is much better targeted and it will generally resonate a lot, lot better with your audience. The last thing is measuring things. Is it working? Um, don't just throw spaghetti at the wall and hope for the best. When you are designing your position, figure out how you'll know if you're wrong. And that's what this is all about. So have a plan and run through a, run through a process. Um, this is a general structure of how we like to think about it. You need to baseline, you need to understand what you're doing right now because you're about to go and change things and you want to be able to figure out if what you changed worked. Did it hurt you or did it help you? If you haven't got a baseline, you don't know. Uh, so go and have a look at some way of measuring what is your current brand awareness, what do your purchase rates look like, do you have any market share? Have a baseline and then when you implement your campaign, track what you're actually doing. Have a way that you can go and measure it. Um, test what you're doing early. So before you go full bore on something that you say, right, we're going to run with this for six months, 
try to get an early indication if you're wrong and fix it early. Um, that's, you know, those early conversations with, with customers, do a bit of message testing. Um, so then validate what you're doing against what your goals were. Is it working? Understand when the right time is to check that. So for example, if you run with a big content campaign, we've had people who've decided, okay, we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna be all about open source and we're going to start this, we're gonna open source some code and we're gonna build a community and it's all gonna be amazing and it's, we're gonna turn it into sales in six weeks. That's not realistic. Um, certain approaches like trying to build a community, that's months and years worth of constant effort. And if you're not ready to put in that effort, don't start. Um, some of these things as well, like uh, we've had clients who say, oh, we, we're going to start a blog. They underestimate how much effort there is in, in writing a blog, like writing one blog every week while you're running the company and doing everything else you need to do is actually a lot of work. It's surprising how hard it is to write a weekly column. Um, so if you, particularly if you're not used to writing a weekly column for a newspaper or something like that, um, it's a fantastic exercise to get, to get into the habit of doing that. Partly you'll learn how to write and communicate your ideas better, but it's also the discipline of finding the time and the space to actually sit down and write something that is worth reading. And to do that every week is amazingly difficult to do. So when you go and try, when you're gonna try out some of these plans, think about what's actually required to do it for long enough to have a good result. If you validate too early, you'll get the wrong idea and say, oh, it's not working, this was a terrible plan, let's abandon it and change plan completely. Um, we had one client who was like that when we came in to consult with them, um, we had marketing came into the room, we had sales in the room, we had, had the whole team together and sales expressed their frustration that the messaging, uh, they were selling an enterprise product and the enterprise sales cycle for them, they'd worked out was somewhere between about six and nine months. And that's not, that's actually relatively short, particularly for the product they were selling. Normally in enterprise, it can be as long as about 18 month sales cycle from first contact to closing the deal. And they were frustrated because marketing kept changing the messaging. They'd change, their, the, they'd change the whole comms plan every three months. And sales was saying, we, we go to a client, we go to a customer and we've had two meetings with them. And then we come back for the third meeting and everything's changed and we have to start over. So they were actually getting in their own way by, ch by chopping and changing too often. So do your homework and figure out what is going to be the right thing. Pick it and then back yourself and then plan it and run with it and keep doing it until you know that, okay, we have enough data, we've run it for a long enough time to be able to tell whether or not this worked.